I'm going to hand over to our reporter, Abra Barbia, who is live from us just outside of Parliament. Abra, good afternoon. If you can hear me, let's get your reaction. What, what, what are MPs saying, perhaps, on the back of that um, finance, um, MTBPS um, mini budget statement that obviously had just been delivered by the finance minister? Afternoon. I'm not sure if I heard you correctly. We seem to be breaking up a bit, but I'm just going to jump straight into my conversations with the MPs because they, of course, the ones we are here for to get their reactions to what the minister said. Mr. Steve Swart of the ACDP is up first with me. Mr. Swart, you say that your worst fears have been confirmed after that speech. Yes, indeed. The minister indicated that our debt to GDP is going to reach 77%, and that has been my biggest concern with the budget deficit increasing by 54 billion rand from February's projections and this is unsustainable as the minister indicated we're facing a financial and fiscal crisis. The only solution is to stimulate economic growth so that one can create jobs and collect higher revenue and then of course spend the revenue and that you have correctly not waste money and of course collect those billions of rands that have been stolen through state capture and corruption. In that way we can balance the books to a certain degree but as it looks at the moment things are looking very dire and so February's budget will be very careful when we study that in detail to see how the minister intends dealing with this financial and fiscal crisis. Thank you so much for your time Steve. I'm now going to speak with Mr Ngaba Yomzi Kwankwa of the um, UDM. Thank you so much for speaking with us today sir. You heard what your colleague in the um, ACDP said. He says the situation is dire. Um, we're speaking about increases, we speak about inflation but can you just break it down for the man on the ground? What did today's speech mean for the man on the ground? For your granny, for my granny, for our aunts and uncles? It means the country is broke. It means we are teetering on the edge, on the edge rather, of a, a cliff, a fiscal cliff. That's what's going to happen if we continue on this path. No fiscal consolidation over the years has been done. No proper management of the country's finances has been done. They've been tra promising to fight corruption, to deal with issues of government. They have not been able to do that. I said a couple of years ago that the efforts and the statements which are made by the ANC committing that they are going to fight against corruption are as credible as a, as a cat deciding to conduct a, a commission of inquiry into the disappearance of mice because there's no commitment. They are the ones responsible for this thing and they never resolve it. The country's broke. Imagine if we are going to borrow 553 billion rands per annum in order for us to survive, to be able to meet our expenditure needs, to be able to provide funding for ESCOM. Imagine if your debt service costs are going to be 400 billion rands per annum. What, how are you going to pay for other services? Another pressing and competing needs of the country. And it's simply because the NC government has not been able to manage the country's finances. Full stop. Thank you so much for much your time. Pleasure. We'll catch up with you again. There you have it, Mr. Ngaba Yomzi Kwankwa of the UDM. Of course, in a nutshell, telling us that the country is broke. I'm now crossing to my colleague, Bulalani, who I think is on the steps. Um, Bulalani, is it over to you now? Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to take a uh, more political reaction right here on the steps of the Cape Town City Hall. I'm going to bring in ANC Secretary General, uh, Mr. Fikile Mbalula. Thank you so much for your time, sir. This budget of the minister, does it strike the right chords for you as the ruling party? Yes, it does. I mean, uh, uh, it strikes the right chords because we did talk about uh, that this budget shouldn't be about austerity. Uh, should be about cushioning the poor and at the same time uh, ensure that we remain focused in terms of our infrastructure uh, projects. But at the same time, uh, we ensure that uh, education and health are equally um, protected in terms of the budget and uh, social security protection investment also is uh, also taken care of. So with all the challenges that we are facing, we think that uh, this strike the right uh, balance in terms of the challenges that uh, we are facing. Just in terms of the state-owned companies, uh, quite a headache uh, for the finance minister. The draft uh, plans that he's trying to you know, put forward in terms of assisting struggling state-owned companies, do you think is on the right path? Uh, it's on the right path. It's a difficult one. We, we talk about concessions and also total commitment to reforms, particularly Transnet and the ports. Uh, because uh, more investment and striking a balance with the private sector will ensure that we unlock a growth potential which will lead to more employment. 
and that is what we need to move uh, with speed and ensure that we deal with. And lastly, on ESCOM, I mean, the minister are talking about plans uh, to cut uh, the ESCOM debt, but uh, the condition being that uh, municipalities must install uh, prepaid meters. Do you think you're going to buy, get a buy-in from communities? Communities have long uh, bought into a social compact of uh, saying that uh, uh, they will too come to the party, and uh, including in terms of electricity provision. So in this particular instance, we need to move ahead to implement the social compact with communities in terms of water and uh, installation of prepaid, but at the same time that goes for electricity as well. So that social compact is very important in terms of uh, bringing stability, uh, particularly when it comes to electricity provision as well as uh, water. All right, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Figi Lembalula, ANC Secretary General. I'm going to bring into this conversation now Ingo Simza Mubutelezi. Thank you so, so much, sir. Uh, as the IFP, do you welcome uh, this uh, midterm budget by the Finance Minister? The statement by the Minister actually did inspire any confidence in terms of uh, our future prospects as a country. We really are not happy as the IFP. Our debt remains very high, uh, and also the saving, the, the cost. The, 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 the cost to service that debt is also very high. The public wage bill remains very high and you mentioned that our revenue collection is very poor. So that is a serious problem for our country and as we said prior to this uh, budget that we don't expect anything from the ANC because the same government which has caused us so much trouble cannot bring the solutions. We are only looking forward to next year where people are expecting a new government that will have a keen interest in trying to solve their plight. So what Minister said did not inspire any confidence to us and the issue of bailouts to state-owned entities remains a problem. We have been saying this from the beginning that ESCOM's problems, all these state-owned entities has nothing to do with finance. They are not financial problems. Therefore, you can never solve them by putting financial what you call solutions. Thank you so much, uh, IFP you Deputy much. President uh, Ngosem Zamo Utelezi. Let me try and bring in the EFF Chief Whip, uh, Mr. Flo Chibambu. As the race, do you actually welcome uh, this midterm budget by the minister? We do not welcome uh, this midterm budget as the EFF. We actually reject it with the content it deserves because this is an austerity budget. It's a reduction of the initial budget that was allocated. So if you look into the division of revenue bill which has been introduced by the Minister of Finance, it's reducing more than 6.2 billion allocation to all the provincial grants, and that is the grants that were meant to deal with the healthcare infrastructure, with educational infrastructure, with even the land use and agricultural support uh, programs and grants that normally will be allocated. But also there is a drastic reduction by more than 3 billion rands of the amounts that were supposed to be dedicated to municipalities to respond to uh, various disasters, but also to improve the, the municipal uh, infrastructure. So the MIG, which is the Municipal Infrastructure Grant, has been uh, reduced by 1.2 billion. So you can see that there is no responsiveness to the demands and the aspirations of our people. And this comes as a result of a failing government. So this sitting government of Ramaphosa and Godongwan are failing to expand the revenue base because they can't grow the economy. The economy is shrinking. The revenue base is shrinking as well. So there is no basis upon which they can expand the money that is needed to respond to our challenges. And what is also concerning is the fact that the debt to GDP ratio is now increasing towards 77%. We were borrowing more money than we can afford to pay. I mean, we are spending now more than 350 billion on debt service costs. And that is just paying for the interest of the more than 5 trillion rands which the South African government is owing to the World Bank and to the International Monetary Fund and other financial institutions. So we've got a directionless government. They are refusing to accept the simple fact that they are failing to manage South Africa's economy. That is why everything else is qualitatively and quantitatively uh, reducing in the manner in which it was supposed to, to be handled to respond to the, to the aspirations and interests of our people. All right, thank you so much, uh, EFF uh, Chief Whip, uh, Mr. Floyd uh, Shibambu. Uh, for more reaction, I'm going to cross back to my colleague, Abel. What? what? I'm now going to speak.
speak to Mr. Brett Heron of the Good Party, who actually said to me that he doesn't feel as gloomy and pessimistic as what he felt when he went in earlier this afternoon. Mr. Heron, thank you for speaking to us again. Why are you feeling this way? Because I think we were expecting um, the implementation of severe austerity measures, which generally means and usually means cuts to social services like education, health, uh, police, um, and social security, direct ben benefic benefits of, of grants. And we heard the minister say that there are going to be no cuts to those services, um, the, and that despite the revenue shortfall, we're going to maintain our investment in infrastructure. And so going in there, I was concerned around the talk around austerity measures coming out is clear that the austerity measures have been taken off the table. The government's going to maintain its social spend and is going to maintain its commitment to investing in infrastructure. And if that in infrastructure includes the freight logistics, the transmission of energy and water services as the minister committed, then I think that we can spend our way out of the stagnation and we can start to find some economic growth. I'm almost too scared to ask you about the negatives. I'm going to leave it on that high note <laughs> and then we will catch up with some of the other MPs. Thank you so Thank much you. for your time. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Bulalani Philip, who also has someone with him. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome back again. Uh, we're going to take more reaction now. Uh, bringing now the DA spokesperson on finance matters. Dr. Dion George, uh, coming into this midterm budget, you were actually looking for certain things. Are you pleased that uh, with the steps that have been announced by the minister? No, it was very disappointing. It was clearly a budget for an ANC, from an ANC government that doesn't care about vulnerable South Africans. Um, the minister has spoken about extending the social relief of distress grant, which we would support, but there is no long-term plan and there's no funding going forward. So I will ask the minister tomorrow in Parliament what exactly is the plan. The minister could very easily have cut the taxes on fuel and the levies on fuel to bring down the price of petrol, to bring down the, the, the cost of transportation and therefore food. He could also have expanded the zero VAT rate of basket of food, but nothing of that. In fact, he never mentioned the cost of living once. And that is quite an indictment on a government that's completely out of touch. On the growth aspects, uh, we did note and we did welcome also that the minister mentioned that there would be private public partnerships in infrastructure development. That's been a long-standing DA policy and we of course would support that. But there are no other measures to stimulate economic growth that we need in order to generate the sustainable jobs in our economy. So that was, that was very tepid and, and frankly it was something that we have to talk about in February because there was nothing really there. Then of course on the, on the rolling blackouts, uh, the minister carried on speaking about the plan, it's been so long but the lights are off. So there is no sustainable plan there. We have in the DA got a very comprehensive plan to change the model, but government has no will to actually make it better. So we can just look forward to an economy that carries on growing at a very slow pace. So also, very importantly, debt continues to spiral upwards. The minister is now talking about fiscal consolidation and a fiscal anchor. That speaks directly to a DA private member's bill on, on responsible spending that we already have in Parliament. So we can leverage off that. So we also um, note that. And also very importantly, governments cut, looking at cutting now, cutting departments in important places that will actually impact very heavily on service delivery because debt just spirals upwards and there's no space. There's a revenue shortfall because there isn't enough growth in the economy. The, the government is planning to cut departments, just give it, giving them a haircut across the board instead of looking at what is actually happening. So are the departments efficient and where would be more sensible to cut? We believe they need to cut the public sector wage bill. Nothing on that. It keeps going up. And also the bail to the state owned enterprises. We see there's going to be a bailout now to Transnet. It's either going to be a transfer of the debt onto the national balance sheet or it's going to be a bailout of another kind. And then, of course, a sus a sustainable a support for vulnerable South Africans. There was only the social relief of distress grant and then also no additional money on the judiciary. Now, government says it wants to get off the grey list by 2025. That is way too long. There's no sense of urgency. If they put more money on the National Prosecuting Authority now, we could get off the grey list quicker and that would help our economy to grow. So overall, a very disappointing outing for the minister. I will ask him more, but um, it's unfortunately a government that simply doesn't care. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dion George, uh, the DA spokesperson on finance. For more reaction, we cross over to you, Nobu. Thanks for...
Thanks very much. Uh, we're here in Cape Town after the delivery of the midterm budget policy statement by the Finance Minister Enoch Godongwana. He joins me now. Thank you very much, Minister, for joining us here on SABC. You're going to have to find a whopping 500 billion rand extra or per year, um, you know, to get debt uh, in order to cover our expenditure. Our budget deficit is going to go to 4.9%. Our debt is going to go through to 5.2 um, 5 uh, trillion rand for this fiscal year, 23 to 24. These are very terrible numbers. How did we get here? You, you recognize that in the speech I say uh, these numbers are a product of a longer term period, uh, which, for instance, from the pandemic onwards, all, all countries since the pandemic, they went down and raise debt in order to deal with the pandemic. So we are no exception. If you look at the debt level, the number of countries are all like that. But the point I was making, the size of the debt is not your problem. What you need, the size of the debt depends on the capacity to, to service it. Other countries have got more than 100% debt to GDP ratio. There's no problem. So what is important for us to focus on sorting the growth and therefore our capacity to deal with these numbers will not be a threat. But Minister, we've been talking about capacitating better economic growth for years and years. Even when you spoke about procurement, we learned about the Chief Procurement Officer in the National Treasury years and years ago. It seems as though we have lots of plans, but they're just not executed. You know, what you, I also said, if you listen there, I said how this economy is resilient. I quoted a number of sectors which show that there's an improvement in the number of sectors. Were it not for the problem in the coal, in the mining sector, our economy would have been doing well. So there is progress. There is progress in transforming the economy. And in those figures I refer, unemployment is going down. So there's progress. Minister, when are we going to get through uh, you know, the one, two percent growth level. When are we going to get there? Because there's a lot happening. We know the private sector and government is working together, but when are we going to see meaningful growth? Watch the space. Watch the space. When we say we're sorting out electricity, we're sorting out logistics, we'll be sorting out crime, we are also saying watch the space next day. The amount of in government investment that's going to take place next day in the form of infrastructure, which will crowd out, um, which will basically pull out a uh, great demand in the economy and therefore propel employment and all other sectors, were determined to achieve that objective. It's welcomed, of course, that you've decided to extend the social relief of distress grant until the end of March 2025. But of course, the big question mark is how sustainable is this going to be, given that it costs the fiscus about 36 billion or so? We, we have got to reprioritize the budget. If the policy of government, my job is, is simply the following. If government says to me, uh, which is not my decision, says we still want to continue with the a social reform, I mean, the 350, let me put it that way, SRD. That government says, my job is to go and look at the budget. How do I reprioritize it in such a manner that I can be able to fund it? That's what we have done. You will see that what I've done, I'm also realistic. I don't know whether it's the promise of ending it in March 2025 is going to be sustainable, but I've made provisional allocation for another two years. And lastly, Minister, the issue of the public uh, sector wage bill, it was much higher than you had penciled in earlier in the year. You had penciled in a budget of about 1.6% increase and it went up to 7.5%. You'll correct me if I'm wrong with the numbers. So going forward, you're going to be increasing the public sector wage by inflation on this base. How sustainable is that going to be? Let, let me just say, I mean, this wage bill is a scarecrow, right? If you look at how much we have made provision for it, the agreement. The agreement talks about 7%, 7.5%. But if we disaggregate that, already 400% people were getting it in the form of cash. What, all what we did was to translate that into the baseline instead of being a cash statute. So in essence, there was a 400% which were translated into the cash statute. So the difference was really a 3 percentage points. Uh, were it not for the other cost pressures, the wage bill would not have been a problem, but we had a number of other cost pressures, including SRD, which did not have funding. 
Very, very lastly, Minister, Transnet, it sounds like they're going to be needing a bailout from government. Are you going to be giving them that? If I, if I do that easily, you will, SABC will be in the queue quickly. So <laughs> Are you going to give us some money? <laughs> If I gave us, uh, I give the money quickly. I know that I'm creating a perverse incentive. So, Transnet will have to make certain conditions for them to get a, a bailout, and we've, we're going to spell those out. I did indicate uh, what are the things that we require for Transnet in order for Transnet to uh, to get any assistance in whatever form. Minister, thank you so much for talking to us. You, you are now released. Thank you. Minister of Finance there, Enoch Gorongwana, speaking to us. I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, Bulelani Finet. Well, thank you so much again. Uh, we're going to bring into this conversation now, build one South Africa leader, Mr. Musi Maimane. The outlook of this budget, is this taking us to the promised land? Certainly not. I, I think if you're, if, if you're a politician inside the system, this budget suits you. But the people suffer today. They suffered because we're paying for the sins of poor legislation that's happened. We allowed ourselves to be grey listed, now citizens have to pay for debt servicing costs. We allowed ourselves to have a cabinet that's big, despite the restructuring being promised since 2013, cabinet remains the same size. We're seeing budget cuts almost immediately, 1.7 billion rands in education, just over 2 billion rands in higher education, so it's clear that what this budget indicates is that we're running out of money, but instead of cutting cabinet, we cut services to people. That's what this budget is. So the people lost today and the politicians won. All right, thank you so much. I'm going to bring in NFP MP, uh, Mr. Munzur Sheikh. Uh, for you as the NFP, are you happy with this budget presented to you? We start off by saying the future looks bleak unless we make a complete turnaround. I mean, if you look at that, we are going to go not Six trillion rand in debt, 385 billion rand a year is going to be paid to debt service costs and rising, something that we've been raising year in and year out. And the minister is raising concerns about it, but what measures are we putting in place to deal with those concerns and challenges? Let me give you an ideal example. 400 billion rand is lost in this country every year. He talks about corruption. We know where the problems are. Yes, indeed, he's talking about the procurement bill that we're bringing in. But he at the same time says he doesn't think it's foolproof. It's not going to solve the problem. Now, let me say this. You're taking money from higher education. You're taking money from basic education. You're taking money from water and sanitation. What is that impact it's going to have on the delivery of services in those departments? On the other hand, you want to pay attention, you says, to water and sanitation, but you're taking out. You want to increase the social relief distress grant, you want to extend it for another year, but you're taking money from social development as well. So you can see the difficulty that we're going to have. Take the South African police services. Yes, they're giving them additional budget, which I appreciate. It's not enough if you look at the police force, what they go and the, the condition that they work and have to live under. If you don't motivate them, they're not going to deliver. But where we're heading to currently is this a fiscal cliff, which I've raised about the last seven or the ten years that I'm there. First, which means we would be bankrupt. He said a few days ago that as early as in April, we're going to be penniless. But the question is, why now? When you could see year in and year out, the debt service cost is going up, your debt to GDP has been going up, but we've not been doing enough about it. He talks about, and I'll tell you where the solution is. Keep politicians out of procurement. I promise you the day you do that, they must have nothing to do with procurement and tenders and nothing to do with appointing or employing anybody. Separate politics from administration. You'll save hundreds of billions of rent and you'll get better delivery of that. All right, thank you so much. I'm Munzur Sheikh Imam, NFP MP. Uh, for more reaction, we cross back to you. Nabu. Hi there, thank you very much uh, for joining us here uh, outside City Hall, where of course we just spoke to the Finance Minister Ino Gorongwana. I'm now joined by Mondugungu Bele, he's the Minister of Telecommunications and Digital Technology. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. So what did you think of the midterm budget? Of course, uh, there are a lot of pressures that the National Treasury has and getting the balance right. Your thoughts? It demonstrated uh, a focused budget and uh, a lot of confidence in the circumstances of adversity. Uh, it's a tight yet developmental budget. It touches all the critical points. For instance, 
to social departments like health, education and crime, very critical, uh, being allocated, a, committed, a commitment to finance infrastructure, which is a dire area where a turnaround should take place, commitment to deal with logistics, especially when you talk about Transnet and so on. I mean, it, it touches all the key areas of economic reform. And it has actually refreshed our minds in terms of how resilient our economy has been in spite of COVID, in spite of load shedding. And you can see that our economy wants to grow. And I think the MTBBS demonstrated a framework that is in line with the resilience of the economy. Thank you very much, Minister. Have a very good afternoon. <laughs> Minister Kungubele, uh, Telecommunications and uh, Digital Technology uh, Minister, speaking to me there. Let's hand you over to my colleague, Bulelani Philip. All right, thank you so much again uh, for more political reaction. I'm bringing in now uh, Al Jama President, uh, Mr. Hanif Hendricks. For you as the party, this uh, budget by the minister, do you think it's pro poor? Look, uh, this is not the Minister of Finance's budget. This is the budget of the president and the deputy president. They went around to every cabinet minister and, and talked about containment measures. And then they went to the minister of finance and he had no choice but to bow to the wishes of the presidency. So we are very disappointed that this is not, let's call it a professional budget. It's a budget dictated by the presidency. Having said that, it's a budget of appeasement. The minister must have had in mind some drastic measures uh, to sort out the financial crisis and to come up with a fiscal policy that will address it. If you look, for example, at his reference to illicit financial flows, the minister doesn't understand what is illicit financial flows. He thinks it's only criminal activities. But illicit financial flows uh, understood in the, the national world is where companies and conglomerates uh, rape the country's GDP and use uh, all the loopholes to get money out of the country. So to cut the long story short, 50% of South Africa's GDP is lost through illicit financial flows. Just imagine if that was added to the fiscus, then the minister would not have had uh, the, the problems that they had because this budget does not address uh, uh, so many have been left out municipalities have been left out wards have been left out projects have been left out so the minister has picked and choose what the president wants to be addressed and there has not been enough money expropriated for example to address the water crisis Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Khalif Hendricks, uh, the president uh, of Al Jama Party. Uh, Nompu, I'm going to cross back to you for more reaction. Thanks very much uh, for joining us here in uh, Cape Town. Of course, uh, we're still speaking to a number of people following the delivery of the midterm budget speech by Finance Minister in Kodongwana. I am joined now by Ronald Lamola. He's the Minister of Justice, just to give us his thoughts on the midterm budget. So thank you very much for speaking to us. We know that crime is a big deal when it comes to fixing the economy. Right now, there's a lot of focus on crime, logistics and energy. What did you think of the midterm as it pertains to your particular portfolio? Uh, thank you. Uh, obviously, it is a very tight rope, uh, which requires all of us to be disciplined in the management of um, the finance and the budget. And obviously, it's a framework outlining uh, what is the future outlook, which obviously we all have to work on it, w welcome it, and um, we think it's doable. It will enable us to ensure that we continue to render uh, justice in our country, that justice is accessible. And the issues here, are, you are talking about of um, crime, um, issues of um, um, related to corruption, issues related to the functionality of the courts across the country, we believe we can be able to continue with the transformative projects that we have started. Minister, people are very cynical about the Zondo Commission's uh, you know, recommendations and the implementation thereof. 
How far are we in this regard? What's your level of confidence in this being addressed? Yeah, the president has outlined what has already been done. There's been a number of amendments to a number of legislations. The Minister of Finance today also outlined those laws. We have also tabled in Parliament the NPA amendment bill, which is aimed to make the ID permanent. And the ID also have a number of cases already in the court roll. So the, roll, the, 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 the ball is rolling even on the wheels of justice in terms of uh, courts processes that the uh, people that have been identified, more than 200 people accused are appearing in our courts across the country. So the wheels of justice are beginning to turn. Minister, thank you very much for your time and we wish you well. Minister uh, Roland uh, Lomala uh, speaking to us there. He's the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services, confident about the future. Let's continue with our coverage. Back to our reporters who are live in Cape Town. Let's uh, hear what they have to say. Nombu, it's over to you. Thanks very much, my dear. Um, so I am now joined uh, by Matthew Parks. Uh, he's the parliamentary coordinator for COSATU uh, here in Cape Town. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. So what are your initial thoughts around the midterm budget, uh, especially when uh, the higher public sector wage bill has been fingered as one of the major reasons for government being in this situation where it's now expending more than it receives in revenue? Yeah. So look, we're quite disappointed. The minister really didn't say much. We're facing a myriad of crises as a country from a stagnant economy, a 42% unemployment rate, a 60% youth unemployment rate, load shedding, cable theft, which has crippled transit, which is killing the mining, the manufacturing, the agricultural sectors, collapsing municipalities. There was nothing specifically new that it says we're going to turn things around and we're running out of time. We had hoped government would have actually dealt with the fundamental obstacles to the economy instead of simply trying to outsource the blame and the bill to nurses. If you look at the million term budget statement, it actually reveals that the wage bill is not out of control. It's been declining. It's gone down from 35% a few years ago to 31% of the budget today. The headcount itself has been shrinking. So the crisis we're in today is because of Transnet. So they have to fix Transnet because that will enable the mining industry, which is a huge contributor of company taxes, of revenue to the state and to the economy. If we don't fix that, there's no amount of pickpocketing a nurse or police officer which is going to fix that. Paying a, a nurse peanuts is not going to make the trains run on time. So government needs to stop outsourcing the blame for its mismanagement of the state and deal with the real issues. But to continue to think that somehow cutting budgets is going to grow the economy is not based on economics. It's based on an outsourcing of blame and we're going, to, we're going to be in a worse crisis unless government really deals with the obstacles to growing the economy. So what do you think is going to happen? Because on the one hand, the government's talking about cutting expenditure by 21 billion rand in this particular fiscal year. But at the same time, it's telling us that it's continuing to give extra money to the likes of the police, the health sector, education and so on. From your point of view, uh, how do you see this? And if, you're, if your view of it is that you're actually getting less in real, in real terms in those sectors, does that mean that we as the public who use those public facilities are going to be far worse, worse off? It means exactly that, because in the budget they've, they've budgeted for a decrease in the police headcount. So it defies logic that crime will somehow fall if we're having less and less police numbers. The police headcount has decreased from 200,000 a decade ago to just over 170,000 today, and they're planning for further cuts. They've now cut funding to home affairs by about 6 billion rand in the minimum term budget statement. So how is that going to decrease the queues at home affairs? Now, government has shown that if you invest in public services like the South African Revenue Service, give them additional money, hire the right staff, the right skills, the right technology, you can turn things around. But it's continuously cutting, 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 and not dealing with the issues of the economy and the mismanagement, that's going to make matters worse. We're not going to reduce the queues at hospitals if we have less nurses. And if we think we're going to pay nurses or teachers or police officers less and some of the things will get better they won't. In fact what you'll see is that skilled public servants like doctors and nurses will leave the state, they'll go to better paying jobs overseas or the private sector and it's going to make things worse. So for us really it's about dealing with load shedding, dealing with transit and metro rail, collapsing SOEs, municipalities, growing the economy, giving relief to, to businesses and to the, to the poor and to the working class, investing in infrastructure. That's how you grow the economy. If the economy grows, if businesses can sell the products then they'll have the revenue to pay the state, the taxes it needs to pay down the debt to fund public services. But simply thinking we can cut the medication to a, to a patient in the ICU and some of that patient won't die, that for us is not based on common logic.
One last uh, question, Mr. Parks. Um, I've spoken to you countless times about the whole two-pot retirement system, and we did learn last week, it happened very quickly and very quietly, that the National Treasury now wants to postpone that benefit to the end of March 2025. What's your view on this? Because, of course, you've been campaigning for a higher payout and you've been campaigning for this thing to happen like yesterday. Yeah, so we were quite disappointed with the Treasury officials. We don't believe they had a mandate from the Minister of Finance. We had engaged with the Minister of Finance and he was unaware of what they had informed Parliament. At the end of the day, this is a decision now for Parliament. The bills are before Parliament. Parliament will pass the legislation. And from our understanding from the members of Parliament at the committee meetings, both the ANC and the DA, they agree with Cosato that this two-part relief must happen next year, not be delayed by another year. We've been having this discussion for half a, a decade and that the relief should be meaningful enough, like 50,000 Rand, not 30,000 Rand, to give some sort of relief to workers. So we're still engaging with government, with Parliament, with Treasury. We hope Treasury will take a more sane and compassionate approach to life um, because what they're doing right now is continuously to throw workers under the bus, which is not helping. We've had this discussion since 2020. The bill is there. Pension funds like Old Mutual have said they're ready to implement. We should not be delaying further when workers are struggling simply because a few industries are seeking to, to place profits above the lives of ordinary South Africans. Mr. Matthew Parks, thank you. Always a pleasure chatting to you. Matthew Parks, he is the parliamentary coordinator here at Parliament. Welcome back. We continue our reactions. Medium term budget policy statement being delivered by Finance Minister Ino Godongwana just a few moments ago. We're getting reactions coming through. I believe our reporter Bulilani Philip is standing by. Bulilani, it's over to you. We obviously um, had a rather bleak outlook, some positive reactions and critiques coming through at this hour. What's happening on your end as we speak? All right, thank you so much again. Uh, I'm going to bring in now a SARS commissioner, Mr. Edward Kisweta. The Minister of Finance is looking for money. Are you bringing it to the table? Let me just first say, I hear people say the Minister's message was negative. I think the Minister's message was serious, not negative. And it needed to be serious because the relative to our expenditure our revenue, net revenue, is growing at a slower rate. That means that the, there's pressure on the minister to go and borrow expensive money in order to fund expenditure. And so the message is really to say, we need to have a better balance between expenditure and income. On the revenue, it's important to note that the minister ultimately receives the net revenue collection which means it is the gross revenue that SARS collects, less the refunds that we pay out. And actually there's some positive news there because our gross revenue grew year on year by 4.5% in an economy that's projected to grow at 4.3%. That's not negative, that's positive. Compared to the printed estimate, we are one billion higher than printed estimate. If you look through to the underlying drivers of that growth, you see positive growth in the financial services sector, positive growth in the community services sector, positive growth in wholesale and retail, and the one sector that's really in pain is the mining and quarry sector. Why? Because there is a huge dependence on the mines in a reliable and cost-effective supply of electricity, and then a reliable and cost-effective logistics industry that can take the production to the ports or to the clients. And in both these instances, the impact on the economy has had the biggest knock-on effect on mining and quarrying. And we see, therefore, a deduction or a slowdown in corporate taxes. But on balance, gross tax revenues have improved. The other effect is we are paying out, we have paid out 29 billion rand more in refunds than what was projected. Now, that's not all good news because refunds means we are getting money back into the economy, into the hands of households, into the hands of small businesses for whom cash flow is their lifeblood. So that's good. 
We're paying it out faster. We are verifying those returns quicker. We've increased from 74% of returns within 21 days to 84%, 77 to 84%. But the nature of the spend is also important because we see companies are spending more on their input costs. They're paying more for fuel, more for electricity because they're creating it through other sources. They're paying more for labor, which means that they therefore can claim a higher deduction on the refund side. So that's driving higher refunds. The other thing that's driving higher refunds is people have invested in self-generation. Companies have bought their own generators or they have bought their own solar and batteries and inverters and they can deduct that for tax purposes uh, over through the VAT refund system. Um, and so what we are seeing is a healthy refund economy. Refund is somewhere between 4 and 6% of GDP, in fact, uh, if you take a full year view. A healthy refund, which clearly has reduced the amount of money that ultimately ends up with the minister. But you have to look at revenue at its overall and see what's happening in the different sectors, what's happening in the economy, and how that ultimately produces. Now, the minister is only interested in what he lands up in his bank account. But the question I want to ask again is that, uh, is, is it your strategy to, to use fear as part of uh, trying to ramp up uh, revenue there collection? There is no need for us to do fear. In fact, our strategic intent is very clear. We want to help taxpayers by helping them understand their obligations. We want to make it easier for them to fulfill those obligations. The taxpayers whom we want to have a healthy fear are dishonest taxpayers, are thieves, are people who steal from you and me because they make fraudulent uh, statements in their returns. And if they are fearful, they should be. But no honest taxpayer should ever have to fear engagement with SARS. And where sometimes our staff becomes overzealous, we would willingly take feedback from them and address those issues, as we have with the recent unfortunate SMS that went out. We took action. The SMS went out to, to every taxpayer on a well, what, what, what action have you taken? Was you have been forced to apologize? No, we've not been forced to apologize. We apologize because we own up. Right? SARS has 12,500 people. Here and there, a manager or a person may act out of the governance framework. That SMS, firstly, was an incorrect choice of medium because the SMS went out to honest and dishonest taxpayers. You can't do that. If I'm an honest taxpayer and I receive a message that sounds like a threatening message, I have the right to be offended. And it is to those taxpayers that we have apologized. What should have happened was not an SMS to every taxpayer, but a media statement that says the following. One, you expected to file your returns by your due date. Two, if you don't file by the due date, we will nudge you, we will remind you. If you ignore our reminder, you will face criminal prosecution. There's nothing wrong with the content of the message, but it was the medium of choice that led us down. And we have addressed internally through our disciplinary processes, those who were responsible for that. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Edward Kiswita, SARS uh, Commissioner. Uh, all the best in uh, revenue collections. Uh, all right, uh, for more reaction now, I think I'm going to cross back uh, to Nompu. Thank you very much uh, for joining us here in Cape Town. We continue with our rolling coverage of the midterm budget policy statement. I'm joined by Riza, uh, Riza Ishmael. He's the prescient uh, investment management. He's from Prescient Investment Management. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Riza, for joining us. So, of course, the markets will have been looking very closely at this uh, at this midterm budget. Very terrible numbers coming out. Um, 385 billion rand is what uh, government is going to have to pay in terms of uh, the uh, interest costs per annum. Yeah. 
and then that's going to tick up. Also, the debt is going to tick up to over 5 trillion rand this year and go up to 6 trillion rand the following year. The numbers look devastating. You've been looking at the bond markets. How have they reacted? Uh, sure. Somewhat, somewhat paradoxically, um, the bond market has actually, um, um, in the immediate aftermath of the announcement, the bond market has actually uh, rallied. In other words, it's, it's actually reacted with some strength. So the curve, meaning that long-dated bonds are up uh, close to a percent in the immediate aftermath of these announcements. Um, as I say, somewhat paradoxical. I mean, we have seen some eye-watering numbers um, coming out of the uh, of the address. I mean, we we see now the debt to GDP profile now quite steepening. You'll see that it, 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 it's set to almost normalize at around 77 percent. Um, this is a significant um, sort of delta from around 73 or 74 percent at the time of the February budget, and it remains remains to be seen um, how 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 the uptake of uh, that kind of profile profile is anticipated and taken up by the market. As in the minister's own words, you know, it, it, it remains largely a problem of, of underwhelming growth. You know, so the, the, the debt profile and the bond issuances can be what they are, provided that you have sufficient growth to basically generate revenues to effectively service those kind of those kind of debt numbers and unfortunately the growth profile of South Africa is plagued by sort of long-standing structural impediments which relate to poor capital formation which relate to low business confidence and which relate to the perception of policy uncertainty so those kind of hurdles that um, stand in the way of of, 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 of sort of um, uh, sort of reliable growth and real growth um, is, is what is really going to be the thing to watch in the next two or three fiscal windows. What, what are your feelings and views around what government's trying to do with municipalities? They owe ESCOM to the tune of about 60 billion rand um, and there's an opportunity for their debt to be written off by government. But how do you ensure that doesn't happen? They have a clean slate and then they go back to square one and not paying their obligations. I think that is exactly the risk. I think that, um, you know, e effectively to call a spade a spade, the problem that we've had with municipalities was that um, there was outright, uh, you know, sort of maladministration and also misappropriation of funds and just outright corruption in, in, in some instances. Now you have a situation where um, all debt, uh, you know, up until the 31st of March 2023 will effectively be, be written off subject to certain conditions. But in reality now, it does create somewhat of a perverse incentive in, in, in the sense that now you you have uh, effectively these were monies that were in some sense now being owed to ESCOM that is now going to be written off for municipalities that were not performing that were that were allocating capital poorly that that's now going to be written off and, and at some point along the line that's going to create a hole with regards to the monies that are due to ESCOM. ESCOM will then very likely need to again come cap in hand uh, to the Treasury at some point down the line you know if this kind of um, if this kind of thing were, were to continue so I think it, it does create a risk. Some years ago, we observed the likes of Greece and other countries undergo very difficult times because they basically defaulted on their debt. How close is South Africa to any type of scenario like that? Or do you have the confidence, like the minister, that we're going to get the growth that we need to be able to generate enough revenue to deal with our uh, debt burden as well as create growth and, and jobs? I think I think the issue around around actual actual outright default, i.e., the non-payment of uh, coupons and, and and sort of principal values, I think that that actually shifts to a different issue. I don't think it's going to be uh, a situation for any country that has got monetary sovereignty, i.e., that can sort of print their own currency, to have a situation where they cannot actually service their own debt. The problem is, for example, what will, what will in fact happen to inflation dynamics once uh, the central bank starts to monetize that kind of debt profile? So it will. It will land up in a situation where there's one room of the house effectively printing more bonds and then there's a room right next door in the same house that are buying up those same bonds. So the question is uh, not whether you will get your capital back with regards to the African bonds, but how much dollars can those bonds necessarily buy at that time. So I think the, the, the problem will reduce to an infl inflationary problem um, and, and we'll have to see how that kind of thing pans out. And one last comment that you want to make that I haven't covered that came out of the midterm. I think the bond market, part of the reason, if I just, you know, in the area that, that I sort of play, the bond market, I think if we were just to just take a step back, I think that there was perhaps the expectation on the part of the bond market that there would be some um, explicit pronouncement with regards to Transnet. Now, that has now not happened, um, and, 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 and one can only suppose that that is part of the reason why the bond market has in fact rallied, even though we do see dire debt-to-GDP kind of trajectories being uh, being put out. Um, so, that, that remains to be seen, and, 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 and evidently, 
Transnet has to produce a roadmap of sorts to indicate where they will in effect garner some efficiencies before uh, such time that government basically offers any kind of assistance with regards to debt relief or with regards to direct capital kind of injections. So it remains to be seen what, what will co come out of that roadmap, but for now, nothing explicit going in the way of Transnet. Ishmael, thank you so much uh, for speaking to us here at the SABC. Um, uh, that was uh, Risa Ishmael. Uh, he's the head of bonds at Prescient uh, Investment Managers. And uh, of course, uh, it's been a pleasure delivering the midterm budget policy statement to you on this day, where, of course, Finance Minister really revealed horrendous numbers. But according to uh, Risa, it seems as though the bond markets have taken these numbers in their stride. They're going to be keeping a close eye on the South African story. Of course, it's going to be more costly for the South African uh, government to borrow more money on the market. Uh, the, the minister has indicated that it has to borrow a further, about 500 billion rand per annum uh, in order to fill uh, the gap that there is between the revenue it's receiving and, uh, of course, the expenditure that it needs to take. Good news, of course, uh, for the vulnerable is that the social relief of distress has been extended out to the end of March 2025. But, of course, the sustainability of that um, is questionable and they're going to be uh, measures will need to be taken to be able to make that a more prolonged thing. Of course, uh, there are lobby groups who are pushing that this should be converted to a basic income grant at a higher value because, let's face it, 350 rand from 2020 is not that much, especially given the inflation experience that we've all had. Well, that's pretty much a wrap from the team here in Cape Town, uh, from my colleague Bulelani Phil Philip, Abra Barbier, myself, and all the team that are behind the scenes who make these productions work. It's back to you in studio.